Now let's try and find a Taylor series for sine x. So again, the reason we're interested in a Taylor series for something like sine x is it's transcendental, uh, meaning that I can't give you a formula, a finite formula algebraically, that would tell you how to calculate values of sine. That's why we memorize that chart of common values, right? And those common values came from geometry. Uh, but just any old arbitrary angle, there's not really a formula. So this is ideal for having a Taylor series, because a Taylor series will give us something that at least we can compute with. It'll be infinite, but it'll be a step forward. So again, first decision to be made is where to center this thing. Now we have a few more choices with sine than we did with e to the x. We know sine at 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, and so on. Uh, but keep in mind, not only do we want to know the value of this function and its derivatives at a, we also put that value in here. It's x minus that. And I don't want to have a bunch of terms with pi in it, pi over 3, pi over 6, because pi is irrational. And we'd have an approximation within our approximation. So the best value would be a equals 0, because that makes this nice and it makes this nice. So um, we'll use a equals 0, like we did with um, e to the x as well. Now, um, we'll see that often a equals 0 is a good choice, not for all functions, but for a lot of functions. And Taylor series that are centered at 0, we give them a special name. Maclaurin series, uh, named after a mathematician, Maclaurin, who did a lot of work with Taylor series early on. Um, so if you are asked for a Maclaurin series, really all they're saying is find a Taylor series centered at zero. That's all that means. So this is a Maclaurin series that we're looking at. Okay, so now that we've selected our A, let's try and find a pattern to our derivatives. So the function is sine, first derivative, cosine. And the nice thing about sine is if you differentiate it enough, you will end up back where you started. So this is not going to get unmanageable. By the fourth derivative, you are back to sine. So really all we have to do is find a pattern in those first four, the function and the first three derivatives, because then after that, whatever that is, it just repeats. So we're looking at these at zero, right? That's our a. So sine is zero, cosine is one, negative sine is zero, negative cosine, is negative 1, and then just repeats. So it goes 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Well, really all we have to find a pattern for is 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, because if we just skip the zeros, those terms just aren't there, right? If you think about our formula, that means that on the first degree term, the excuse me, the zero degree term, the second degree, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, all the even degree terms in this series are just gone because they're being multiplied by zero. So instead of trying to generate some algebraic formula that's going to generate this pattern, let's just skip the zeros because they're not even in there. So well, that's easy enough. This is just our typical alternating sequence, right? One negative one, one negative one. We saw plenty of that. Uh, in this chapter. So really what we need to do is alter this slightly though, right? I don't want this to run through every n, right? As you go up through your index in a series, any series, it goes up by 1, right? n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2. So we're going to have to alter these n's here within the formula to get it to skip over the evens. So I want it to generate just a sequence of odds. So I want to replace that n and that n with a formula that would generate the sequence 1, 3, 5, 7. And 
that is easy enough to do. We would just have instead of n factorial, 2n plus 1 factorial. Right? Because when n is 0, that's 1. When n is 1, that's 3. When n is 2, that's 5. So that's the, just the formula for the sequence of odd numbers. And then x minus 0. And again, those are supposed to match, right? The n factorial goes with the n degree. So this needs to be 2n plus 1 as well. Now all I have to do is make this thing that goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And we saw that before. It's either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1, depending on which order you want them in. So let's think about this. When n is 0, this generates the first degree term, which we would like that to be a positive one. And that would be just raising to the n nth power, so negative 1 to the 0 would be 1. The next term, when n is 1, which will correspond to the third degree power, third derivative, you'll get a negative 1. So that will go plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. And again, we could neaten this up just a little bit. Yeah. Negative 1 to the n over 2n plus 1 factorial times x to the 2n plus 1. So compare this to our e to the x series. First of all, it's going to skip all of the even degrees, and it's going to alternate. So let's just write it out longhand to kind of see what we're looking at. So the very first term is the first degree, right? We skip over the constant. The first degree term has a coefficient of 1 over 1 factorial. So um, the first term in our series um, here, when n is 0, let me double check here that I say this right. When n is 0, that's 1, 1 factorial, x to the 1. So our first term is x. Then next is going to be minus, it alternates, and we're going to go up to the third degree. So x cubed, 3 factorial, then plus, going up through the odds, 5 factorial, minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, and so on. So our series would continue on like that forever. What about the polynomials? Now we have to be a little bit careful in our terminology here. So the first Taylor polynomial, polynomial doesn't mean just take the first term. The first Taylor polynomial means go up to, in the formula for a Taylor series, go to n equals 0 or go to the 0 degree term. Well, our 0 degree term wasn't even listed, right, because it had coefficient of 0. So that first Taylor polynomial is just that first 0 there. And then when we move up to the, the first order Taylor polynomial, so the zero order, or our first polynomial, the zero order is zero. This will now include that x. Now when we move to second order, I'd like to include the first degree term that we have, plus also the second, but that's zero as well. And we get those two are the same. Um, and this is going to happen with sine because every other term is missing, right? So we, these polynomials are going to come in pairs. The third order is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial. But the fourth order is also x minus x cubed over 3 factorial. And this is why we use the term order instead of degree when we're talking about these. Um, because, remember, in our definition of what a degree of a polynomial is, it's the highest degree non-zero term, which would be this. So this is really a cubic polynomial, but it's the fourth order in the sense that it includes all the terms up to the fourth order term in that formula. So 
Um, in this case, both the third and fourth order are third degree polynomials, and they're the same one. Um, and this will keep happening in pairs as we go. Okay, so now I'd like to do the same thing I did with e to the x. Let's take a look at the graphs of these Taylor polynomials and see how they compare to our original function sine x. All right, so what we have here is the graph of sine and actually the graph of the zero order Taylor polynomial. You really can't see it because remember the zero order Taylor polynomial is just the equation y equals zero. So it's, it's laid right on top of the x-axis. You're not going to see it there. So let's start moving that order up a little bit. Let's just go up to first order and stop for a second. Remember, first order is going to generate the, ta the uh, tangent line. And we see what we have there is the tangent line of sine x right there at the origin. It passes through the same point and has the same slope. So now let's let the orders increase and see how they compare. Now we'll notice a little pause in between each one because both those orders match, right? Third and fourth are the same, fifth and sixth are the same, and so on. So we're seeing that polynomial match the curve over a larger and larger interval, right? And again, I'll remind you that even though visually those look like they're identical up to that point, there's still some error in there, but we're seeing that error stays small for a much longer period as we go up to higher and higher orders. We're wrapping out farther and farther along that curve as we go up. We're in the 30s now on our order, and we're out to about 14 each way. Um, so it seems, again, much like e to the x, that if we were to let this process continue forever, that those polynomials would start to converge to the function and become um, indiscernible from the function itself. So again, that remains to be proved, but visually it seems like a reasonable assumption maybe that um, these Taylor polynomials will converge to sine x, and not just a round zero like a tangent line does, but it becomes identical to the function over possibly the whole real line, all x values from negative infinity to infinity. Um, so again, we will investigate that further uh, later on, but even as an approximation, Let's just go back here to maybe like a fifth order, well, let's say seventh order. Not very big here. Let me pause that. Let's go up to seventh or eighth order. Think about sine. This is pi over two here, right, where we peak. This little part of our curve of sine is the values of sine in the first quadrant of the unit circle, right? And all other values are related to those. The ones over here are the same, right? All these heights are the same. The ones over here are just the opposite, right? So you can really get everything on the entire curve if you know this little bit well enough. And if we zoom in, even at this resolution, I'm not seeing any difference. Again, there is, there is error there, but it's pretty small. And all we've done is use the seventh order Taylor polynomial, not very complicated to compute. It's only got a handful of terms. So you can get a pretty good approximation for first quadrant values of sine with a fairly low order Taylor polynomial. So this is fairly impressive that we're able to do this with fairly few calculations. Um, and the same thing goes for cosine. Because of the periodicity of these trig functions, you really don't need to match them for very long, and then you can take advantage of the periodic nature to figure out the rest. Um, so next time we'll look at cosine, and we'll do the same thing. We'll develop the Taylor series, and then we'll look here at the polynomials and see how they compare to the function itself.